Hello, dear students. Hope every thing is going good at your end. <laughs> we'll start today uh, with uh, important uh, virology organism. Uh, these organism, the viruses, they cause uh, generalized signs and symptoms, starting from headache, fever, runny nose, cough, sore throat tiredness and body. Uh, we will talk about uh, a group of uh, RNA viruses, one of the important organisms and uh, one of the members of the other group. So we'll talk about uh, two different viruses. Uh, we will finish in time. Uh, so just relax. Uh, the organism that we will discuss, they belongs to the group of paramyxoviruses. Now, any of the group of the viruses which have similar properties to that of the myxoviruses, they are referred to be as the, the paramyxoviruses and the orthomyxoviruses. The myxoviruses means that the myxo refers to the observation that the virus intact with the mucins, uh, which is present on the, on the cell. Uh, we have the paramyxoviruses, we have four important uh, human pathogens, measles, mumps, respiratory essential viruses, and para-influenza virus. Uh, today we will discuss first the generalized uh, properties of this group of viruses. And these viruses, the para viruses, including the para-influenza, they are non-segmented. They have the helical nuclear capsid. This means that the capsomers that constitute the caps, uh, nuclear capsid that are in the helical form, they have the outer uh, lipoprotein uh, envelope and the RNA, you see, it is a, it is a negative standard, a uh, negative priority, single standard RNA genome. We'll talk about this, uh, uh, why. The negative standard RNA uh, polarity viruses, they cannot replicate straight away. I mean, they cannot like the DNA, it makes RNA and the RNA makes proteins. The negative standard RNA, it cannot make the proteins directly. Means it cannot be translated into the myelinations. The negative polarity RNA first has to be changed into the positive polarity RNA. And then this positive polarity RNA makes mRNA and the proteins and things like that. So all those viruses which have the negative polarity RNA genome they always have the RNA dependent RNA polymerase on them. Now this RNA dependent RNA polymerase, it transcribes the negative polarity genome into the mRNA. I hope you get my point. The all negative standard RNA viruses, they must carry their own RNA dependent RNA polymerase so that it can change the negative polarity RNA into the positive polarity RNA and then it, it transcribes into the mRNA. Now the RNA dependent RNA polymerase carrying uh, viruses, the RNA negative standard viruses, they are not really infectious at this own, until, unless they are not changed to the positive polarity RNA. Now the envelope of these viruses, it is uh, made up of uh, hemagglutinin and uh, uh, Neuraminidase, and it has few proteins. This means that we have three types of proteins in this group of viruses. It has the hemagglutin proteins, neuraminidase proteins, maybe only one spike, if you look over here, and uh, sorry for this. And it also has a few protein. Now this few protein is very important. This few protein intact to fuse the cell and make the cell a multinuclear giant cell. So all those viruses, that causes multi-nuclear giant cell formation. They always have the few proteins. Generally speaking, the viruses, they carry the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. But those viruses that cause a giant cell formation, they always have the few protein that helps to fuse the cells together to make it a bigger, uh, larger um, uh, virus. Now the para-influenza virus, this is a virus that is responsible for a disease which is known as uh, acute 
laryngeal tracheobronchitis. It is called as COP. Now, what uh, happens over here? These are three components of the respiratory system they are involved. This virus, it involves the larynx, which is, which is the, the voice box. It causes the trachea, the windpipe, and it also causes the bronchitis. So the collective name for the disease is given as a croup. Croup is, you see, it is a combination of uh, laryngitis, bronchitis, and of course the, the trachitis. And it refers to the infection of the upper respiratory airways. And this airway, it obstruct the breathing and cause a characteristic barking cough. And the cough and the other signs and symptoms that result because of the swelling of this uh, uh, device boxes, they are correctly known as the crop. So crop is the upper respiratory tract infections, characteristically represented by a barking cough. And this is the characteristic of the para-influenza viruses. Now, if you look at the important properties of the para-influenza virus, as we already discussed, the para-influenza virus has all the characteristics of the measles viruses, the mumps viruses, the respiratory syncytial viruses. And this virus is the genome is the RNA and the nuclear capsid is typically of the para viruses. It's made up of uh, hemagglutinin and of course, the, the, we have the fusion protein also. There are two types of like spikes if you look at this. It has one spike that has the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase activities, while the other spike is having the fusion protein. And this fusion protein also have the hemolytic activity. This means two different spikes present on the surface of the virus, one with hemagglutinin and neuraminidase activities, the other with the cell fusion activities and with the hemolytic activities. Now the fusion proteins, as I said earlier, they mediate for the formation of the multinucleated giant cells. Both animals and humans, they are infected with this parent from the virus, but the animals region viruses are not able to cause disease in humans. So we are looking at that sense. Now there are four subtypes of the para-influenza virus that has been distinguished based on to the antigenic potential of this virus, based on to the cytopath effect that it may come to the living cell culture and based on to the pathogenic potential of this virus. So based on to the antigenic variation, pathogenic potential and its effect on the cell culture, we have four subtypes of the para-influenza virus. One, two, three, four. So uh, the, if you look at the replicative cycle of this para-influenza virus, this is exactly the similar of that of the measles virus, mumps virus, and respiratory syncytial virus. All these four viruses, which belong to the para virus group, they all have the same replicative cycle. What happens? There is a drop of the virus to the cell surface via the hemagglutinin receptors. And then after absorption, it penetrates into the cell and it uncoat itself. When the virus uncoat, the capsid is opened and the genome, the viral genome is released, whether it's in the form of DNA or in the form of RNA. So virus enters, it penetrates, and then it uncoat its coating and it releases the viral genome. Now the viral RNA polymerase, it transcribes the negative standard genome into the mRNA as I said earlier. And then the multiple copies of the mRNA, they are synthesized. And then each of these RNA molecule is translated into the specific viral proteins. So we have two types of specific viral proteins. One are concerned with the structure of the viruses. The other group of proteins which is synthesized by the mRNA, it is concerned with the activity or function of the viruses. So the short genome of the virus, it always carries the structural protein the genes and the, and the functional protein genes. First, the structural protein genes, they are uh, uh, translated. Then the functional proteins are required. The helicanicular capsid, it is then assembled. The matrix protein, it mediates in interaction with the envelope and the virus is released. Virus is released by the budding from the cell membrane. It is released by the lysis of the cell. So the parainfluenza virus, they not cause the lysis of the cell, they release from the body of the cell membrane. 
So this replicative cycle is almost true in all, all the measles, the mumps, the respiratory syndrome viruses. The virus enters, penetrate, uncoat, uh, releases DNA, RNA. The RNA is then transcribed and is translated. Specific proteins are formed, which make the function, the structure of the proteins. And then, of course, you see the virus is released by the budding of the cell membrane, uh, budding from the cell membrane. Uh, the pathogenesis of the parainfluenza virus, uh, uh, the virus is transmitted uh, by the respiratory droplets. Uh, it is worldwide in distributions and it occurs primarily in the winter months. So respiratory droplets uh, are the main source of transmission of this infection, uh, which occurs mostly in the winter seasons and uh, almost entire world has the <clears throat> exposure to this infection. It causes of dentist, it causes the upper and lower respiratory tract diseases. And there is no viremia. So this means that the disease mostly remains localized in the respiratory tract because the virus does not enter into the blood and does not establish the viremia, the primary viremia or the secondary viremia. So it does not have the systematic uh, effect on the body. Effect is mostly confined to the respiratory system. And sometimes you see if the immunity is uh, competent enough of an individual, uh, there is subclinical infections and the individual become carrier and uh, the immunity process has been already started in the body. The parent from the virus, as we know, we have the one and two. These are the major group and they cause the major disease, what we call as the group, which is characterized by the tachyitis, laryngitis and, uh, and uh, bronchitis. There's barking, uh, cough like so. And the parent from the virus three group, it is the most common virus that has been isolated from the children with the lower respiratory tract infection. So all children, mostly the disease occur in children, and all children, they have been exposed almost to the parainfluenza group of viruses. Uh, the one and two are concerned with the main disease, whereas the third group is uh, having this subclinical infection in the children. Uh, if you look at the, the clinical findings and diagnosis, uh, uh, the best known as a main cause of crop in children under five years of age is the parainfluenza virus. Whenever you have the children less than age of five years, it is having cough like barking sounds. It is having laryngitis, tachyitis, bronchitis. Uh, it is almost the, you see, the, uh, the certain linear uh, signs for the parainfluenza infection, what you call as the crop. It is characterized by, by the harsh cough and hoarseness over there. Uh, variety of other respiratory tract infections like the common colds, the pharyngitis, laryngitis, uh, otitis media, bronchitis, and pneumonia, it is also caused by a variety of other, other viruses. So many viruses that are involved in this case, the influenza virus, the parainfluenza virus, the adenoviruses that we will discuss right on. They are all involved in these kind of signs and symptoms. Uh, the mostly the infections of parainfluenza in nature, they are diagnosed clinically based on the signs and symptoms. Uh, in the laboratory, uh, we can go for either the isolation of the virus in the cell culture, are by observing the four-fold greater antibody titus. Now, all these three approaches for the identification and diagnosis of the viral diseases, the isolation of the virus on cell culture, then for the antibody titers, uh, and uh, other procedures we always uh, follow in the case of all of these viruses. Uh, now, the viral isolation is mostly done in the reference for all of the laboratory. This is not the routine laboratory diagnostic procedures. It requires specialized techniques, specialized expertise, specialized living cell culture, and specific environment for the growth of this culture. So normally you see, then we have to depend on to the serology, the antibody titers, in order to see that the weather has, uh, the virus has uh, caused an infection in the immediate uh, uh, past or it will, uh, it has provided the immunity to the individuals. Uh, in the modern days, we have the PCR assay, and it is very specific, highly specific, and uh, highly sensitive test. And even a small number of virus can be detected with the help of PCR. Uh, no antiviral therapy is recommended, and there's no vaccine available for the parainfluenza virus. Uh, now, that was all about the parainfluenza virus. Now, we uh, enter into an other virus which belongs to a different group of the uh, 
uh, virus it is a dna non enveloped virus and the name of the virus is the adenovirus and it is a group of virus that causes common uh, common infect the respiratory tract the lungs the intestine the airways and uh, this is what we call as the adenoviruses adeno dna no it does not have the envelope so adeno is a dna virus that does not have the envelope and this virus it was isolated from the adenoid tissues back back in uh, 1953 so about 70 years has been passed till this virus was first time identified or isolated from the adenoid tissue that's why the virus has the name adeno viruses so we have two similarity from the adeno we can interpret that the virus is a dna virus no means that it does not have envelope no envelope dna virus no envelope non envelope dna virus is the dna viruses and secondly the adeno because the virus is localized it causes infection in the adenoid tissue uh, of the body now we have three uh, virus in this group the adeno virus the human papilloma virus and the parvo b19 virus uh the adeno virus uh, causes the respiratory to transmit through the respiratory tract through the fecal route and also through the direct contact uh there is a vaccine but this vaccine has been designed only for the military purpose uh no civil use of this uh, vaccine is, is practiced the human papilloma virus is transmitted through the sexual route and through the skin contact it does have the vaccine also the parvo b19 virus is it is also transmitted through the respiratory route and through the placenta transmission is also there it also has the vaccine so all three members of the adeno virus group the the the, the what we call as the uh human papilloma parvo and adeno they all have the vaccines we will just confine our discussion today on to the adeno viruses now uh let's take the important properties first now if you look at this uh, the it is a non enveloped viruses it is a naked virus it is a double standard linearly configured dna virus adeno viruses is a double standard dna linear uh, virus it's a non enveloped and it has a icosahedral capsid now if you look at the icosahedral if you remember that that the icosahedral symmetry it is a symmetry in which we have almost you see the the 20 20 faces we have the 20 faces of this of this viruses and uh, the only virus which has a fiber that protrudes from its vertices now what is the vertex as you if you remember the the geometry the vertex uh, or the vertices or the vertexes uh, it is a point where you see the two curves are two lines uh, uh, are two edges they meet together so if you look at the configuration of this virus it is where the many lines meet so the the what we call as the fibers they arises from these these matches the peak this is the fiber what what we call as the fiber it has you see it has one base and it has it has the knob the base and the knob and this is the fiber now this fiber it act as a organ of attachment the fibers that protrudes out from the edges of or from 12 vertices of the capsid of the adeno viruses they help in the attachment of this virus with the various organs they are hemagglutinin in nature and they are toxic to the human cells means that if you take this fibers out from the cell out from the virus they can cause disease in the humans so we can say that the pathogenic potential of the adeno virus is because of the presence of the fibers that protrudes they act as organ of attachment and they are also uh, uh, toxin producing now based on to the antigenic variation in the fiber proteins we have almost 41 antigenic different types of the adeno viruses the fiber protein is the main type specific proteins right it's a type specific 
It is not a group specific. Now we have another protein in this, which is a group specific, sorry. Which is, this is what we call the hexon. This is a group specific. Now if you identify this protein, the hexon, this is the protein which is present in each and every genotype or antigen type of the adenoviruses. But the fiber proteins, they are different. Each and every adeno antigenic type is different. The virus has its own type. So based on to the antigenic differences in the fiber proteins, we have 41 types. But based on to the hexon, which is a which is our outer protein, we just have one type. So the group protein is the hexon and the antigen specific protein is the fiber proteins. Fiber protein is pathogenic, it is toxic, and it helps in the attachment of for virus with the body tissue. Now the adenoviruses viruses, they all have common group specific antigen. This is what we call as the group specific antigen. It is what we call as the hexon protein is a group specific, the entire group. All 41 antigenically different type of adenoviruses, they have just one hexon group. So if you want to identify the group, just go for the hexon protein. If you want to identify the type, just go for the antigenic protein, which is present in the, in the fiber. Now the human uh, adenovirus is serotype 12, serotype 18, and 13, they cause what we call as the sarcoma in hamsters. It does not cause any cardiac of sarcoma in humans, but it has been seen in the laboratory animals. Uh, there is no evidence of tumors in the humans. So the G serotype, uh, based on to the fibrous, uh, fiber of the adenovirus, serotype 12, 18, 31, they are not concerned with the any, any type of any cancers in case of humans. They have just given the cancer screens or sarcoma in, in laboratory animals like hamsters. Now the, the disease uh, of the adenoviruses is a variety of upper respiratory and lower respiratory tract infections. Uh, there is a pharyngitis, conjunctivitis, and it's very characteristic. What we call it the pink eye. What we call it the pink eye. Uh, and the common cold and pneumonia, they are all there. There is a keratoconjunctivitis, hemorrhagic cystitis, and gastroenteritis. So uh, it causes, you see, the, the diarrhea does not cause the dysentery, but uh, the virus uh, protein seems to be hemolytic uh, when it uh, comes at the site of the causing cystitis. And now some uh, of uh, these you know, viruses, they can also cause sarcoma and rodents, uh, but the sarcoma has not been documented in case of uh, in humans. Uh, the replicative cycle of adenovirus is the, the fibers. Uh, it attaches itself to the to the surface of the to the surface of uh, the cells, and the virus then penetrate. It then after penetration, it uncoat. It releases its uh, viral DNA, and this viral DNA it moves towards the nucleus. Now listen, and listen carefully. As I said in the very early. Uh, is that uh, the RNA viruses they normally multiply in the cytoplasm or replicate in the cytoplasm. The DNA viruses they replicate in the nucleus. That's why the virus, after uncores, the viral DNA it moves towards the nucleus. And uh, then you see uh, the whole cell DNA dependent RNA polymerase. It enters the host cells, moves towards the nucleus. And it asks the host cell dependent DNA, a host DNA dependent RNA polymerase to transcribe its, its RNA and make its early genes. Now, these early mRNA translated, uh, translated into then non structural proteins. This means that it makes the non structural proteins in the cytoplasm. So, virus makes the structural protein in the nucleus and then it makes, comes out from the nucleus into the cytoplasm and then it makes the non structural proteins in the cytoplasm, and then again, the DNA replication uh, takes place in the nucleus. So absolutely, DNA viruses in general, they replicate in the nucleus. The RNA viruses, they replicate in the cytoplasm. Uh, the uh, DNA viruses, they directly go into the transcription and translation process. They don't have any RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that is required to make the negative standard RNA compared to that of, as we have seen in case of measles and mumps. Uh, the late mRNA, they are done transcribed, 
and they are translated into the structural protein. So first, uh, you see uh, the protein structures and functional both are formed. Uh, the virus assembly again occurs in the nucleus, and this virus it does not burst from the cell membrane, but it it then released by the lysis of the cell. The variants they do not release by budding from the cell membrane, but they cause the lysis of the cell, and then they scope. They are not they do not like the measles, mumps, and respiratory syncytial virus or parainfluenza virus. They are not released by budding, but they are released by lysis of the host cells. The transmission of uh, the adeno uh, viruses, uh, we have uh, uh, the several ways of transmission of these uh, adeno viruses. Uh, aerosol droplet, uh, fecal oral routes, and back transmissions, uh, they all can be uh, seen with the help of uh, uh, these viruses. Now, the the direct contact uh, or the inoculation of the conjectiva, uh, this is by the tonometers or fingers, tonometer of the instruments used by the doctors to see the pressure of the ophthalmologist, to see the pressure of the uh, eye for the glaucoma. So the direct contact, uh, it can cause the conjectiva or uh, and the conjectiva or by the, by the droplet aerosol transmission is there. The fecal oral route is also important. And this causes, uh, mostly you see the Young adults, they are the source of infection to the families uh, because of the fecal roots. So one has three different ways. Aerosol transmit, and aerosol droplet transmission would always cause disease in the respiratory tract. There is direct oculation of conjectiva, conjectiva, it will cause the conjectivitis. There is fecal oral root which leads to the, to the GI tract infection. Uh, the animal stains are there, but the animal stains, they are different than that of the human stains and they do not cause disease in humans. So animal stains do exist, but luckily they do not cause any pathogenic effect for the humans. Uh, the disease is worldwide in distribution. Uh, outbreaks occur uh, among the military recruits, which are living in close contact with each other. So if you look at this, all uh, aerosol uh, droplet uh, transmitted viral diseases, they always have the same phenomena as we see nowadays in case of uh, COVID-19 that wherever there is a congestion of people, there is close living, uh, there, is, there is huge number of people gathered together at some place, they always you see the source of spread of infections with other. This is almost true in case of all viral diseases. Generalized rules and regulations for the transmission of aerosol infections of viral in a region that we are observing today for the COVID-19. They can all be observed from all of the viruses that are spread through the aerosol transmission. Uh, droplet infection. Uh, the specific serotypes, they are associated with the specific syndromes. Not each and every serotype causes disease everywhere or in all organs. The types 3, 7, 4, and 21, uh, they are confined to the respiratory diseases and especially uh, in, the, in the close contact individuals like uh, uh, students living in hostels, military recruiters living in barracks, they are having this infection with type 3, 4, 7, and 21. Uh, type 8 and 19, it causes uh, epidemic keratoconjunctivitis. Uh, type 11 and 12, it causes hemorrhagic cystitis. And type 40 and 41, it causes infantile gastroenteritis. Now, this infantile gastroenteritis and uh, the respiratory disease, they're most common with this. The pathogenicity and the immunity of the adenovirus is uh, uh, the, the in fact the mucosal uh, epithelial uh, uh, of the several organs uh, like the respiratory tract, both the upper and the lower respiratory tract. And they can also affect the gastrointestinal tract and the conjunctiva. And uh, in addition to acute infection uh, that can lead to death of the cells. Uh, the latent infection is always there. The virus undergo latency, particularly in the adenoidal and the tonsillar tissues of the throat. And that's what we call as the adenovirus because of their predilection at the adenoid tissues. We call it ad adenovirus. It was first isolated back in 1953, uh, about five years before I was born. Uh, the clinical finding, the, especially we see the initially the, the respiratory tract. Uh, uh, infections like pharyngitis, pharyngoconjunctivitis, fever, 
acute respiratory diseases. They are all characterized by the fever, sore throat, cries of which is runny nose and the conjunctivitis. Uh, low respiratory tract bronchitis, atypical pneumonia, the pneumonia which is caused by any other organism, maybe viral, or regional, fungal, um, viral, bacterial, fungal or region, other than the, the Streptococcus pneumonia is atypical pneumonia. It is hematuria and dysuria because of the hemorrhagic cystitis. The gastroenteritis, which occurs in uh, serotype 40, uh, in children with non related diarrhea, children, children less than two years of age, and most is all spontaneous, and the 50% of the infection they undergo as, as is symptomatic. So diarrhea in children, most you see the one of the major causes of diarrhea, viral diarrhea in children is the rotavirus. But the denoviruses, it can have a few of its serotypes that can cause the diarrhea in children less than two years of age. The lab diagnosis, as we have seen in generalized cases, that most frequent method is to include the isolate virus in the cell culture. And that I already said, it is not generally attempted because we need specialized techniques, specialized living cell culture, specialized goals requirement, and specialized in manpower for the isolation virus. Uh, so again, we have to depend on the detection of the antibodies and the four, four are greater than antibodies signifies the past infections. Uh, we do have two other tests that is complement fixation test and hemagglutination inhibition test. These are the most important serological tests which are used in the virology for the parent influenza virus, for the influenza virus, for the, uh, for the um, adenoviruses, the complement fixation and hemagglutination tests, uh, one of these can be preferred. Uh, there is no uh, antiviral treatment and uh, prevention is based on to the vaccine. Now we have non live, non-attenuated monovalent vaccines. What does this mean? It's a live virus. It is non-attenuated mean the virus has not been decreased in its pathogenicity. Attenuation means that we decrease the pathogenic potential of the virus with the help of various chemicals and procedures. But we retain the antigenic potential of the virus so that it can produce the immunity by eliciting the immune response of the body. Now, if you give the live virus, and the virus has not been attenuated properly, or it is just a live virus, there is every possibility. There is every possibility that we may have infection because the virus is live. It has not been attenuated. Its pathogenic potential has not been, uh, you see, the eradicated. So all living non-attenuated viruses, vaccines, and all those vaccines with a live attenuated vaccine, they should not, as a general rule, be given to the immunocompromised individuals or to the pregnant woman. Keep in mind. Now, this vaccine is again serotype specific. Each serotype has its own effect. We cannot give the serotype 4 against serotype 5, serotype 5 against serotype 7, or 7 against 11, or 11 against 30. So this is a serotype specific live non-attenuated vaccine. It is a monomer that means we use just one virus. And they all cannot be given simultaneously in the same patient, not together, because they will inactivate each other. So we have three uh, monovalent, non-attenuated live vaccines of adenoviruses, serotype 4, serotype 7, serotype 21. They are administered separately because we cannot use them collectively. They will inactivate each other. And they are given through the oral route. The virus, they have been packed in the capsule in order to avoid the death of or damage to the virus by the gastric juices or gastric acidity. The virus will release in the, in the, in the intestine. And then this release will, of course, cause some damage to the, to the functions of the intestine. There may be diarrhea. Uh, but it will also stimulate the production of the antibodies. And it will then uh, provide the protection of the respiratory tract infection. It infects the gastrointestinal tract, causes asymptomatic infection. And then uh, it, it will induce the immunity uh, to the respiratory disease. Uh, uh, the, virus, uh, the, in fact, the vaccine is not available for civilian use, as we have seen in COVID-19. Uh, China has started using its COVID-19 uh, vaccine in the army, and they have recommended for the military first. So military comes first. 
because they, they, the same are country. So there is heterogenic epidemic uh, keratoconjunctival disease. Heterogenic disease which are produced by the by the manipulation of the physician or by the therapy. Uh, so they are preventable by the strict aseptic and hygiene washing by the healthcare professional and the examining of that. So if you are hygienically taking care of all the procedures uh, which should be adopted for the transmission of uh, diseases like the hand washing, uh, personal care and the and the use of the sterilized equipment, you can avoid this uh, uh, organism, this virus. That was all about the adenoviruses. Uh, hope you enjoyed. Uh, uh, thank you very much. See you next time.